So hello, everyone. I had my glorious moment of successful problem solving by managing to actually have this work uh, right away. I actually spent probably two hours this morning just thinking about how uh, what could be um, going wrong. Um, so um, I'm Azura Ruggeri. I'm a cognitive developmental psychologist. This talk is going to be a little or very much different from the kind of talks we have heard in the first part of this workshop. I wish <laughs> I had delivered and have prepared a different talk for you today because I had a lot of data actually speaking to the kind of conceptual models that we've been talking about this morning. But I'm going to talk about something a little different and then we're going to see how the conversation goes. Um, so um, I'm going to ha huh, see, maybe we do have not here. OK, so um, I realized that my abstract was a little outdated. That's when I thought we would have much more time to um, speak. So eventually I decided to just present some uh, more recent work. So some newish sort of um, set of data in which I'm uh, gonna be focusing on the mechanisms of developmental change, especially thinking about um, curiosity. So it's a very specific project and um, we're gonna start with an example. So imagine this. You are, um, okay, so I had something. So you're at home and you're alone and you cannot find your unicorn coffee mug. So not a big deal, it's just your favorite coffee mug. Um, so you looked in all the usual places, but it's nowhere to be found. So frustrated, you remember, you actually have a home security camera that has been recording the last 10 days. So you could take a look at the footage uh, to see where you last left it, but let's be honest, it's still just a mug, right? Your favorite mug, but just a mug. How long would you really spend going through all that video? But now let's change the scenario. Imagine, if I manage to click, yes. Imagine you live with your partner who swears up and, up and down they have never seen your cup and they have never touched it and they have no idea where it is. But you can't shake the feeling that maybe your partner just moved it and forgot about it, or maybe even broke it, or maybe intentionally hid it because he's deep down a unicorn hater. <laughs> so suddenly this is not about just finding a mug anymore. This is about like a little mystery. There is a hint of suspicion. So you're not just looking for a cup anymore, you're actually searching for the truth. So wouldn't you be more inclined to go through hours of footage now to see whether your husband actually was the one hiding the cup? So after all, the stakes are higher and there is more information to uncover. So the search becomes more than about just the object, it's about satisfying your curiosity and uncovering what really happened. So this is basically what I'm going to be focusing most of my talk on in this set of studies in collaboration with Oana Stanchu, who's a postdoc of mine. We investigated whether and to what extent the opportunity to gain information systematically motivates uh, children's exploratory actions. That is, whether expected information gain serves as an intrinsic reward strong enough to drive exploration and learning, even in absence of external rewards. So across three studies, um, and this is the first sort of set of work I'm gonna present, uh, we measured 24 to 56 uh, month old children, so two and three year olds persistence in a game in which they had to look for Sam, a cartoon animal hidden behind a series of closed doors. So basically they were just presented with one door at a time, they had to touch the door in order to open it. They would not find the animal behind any of the <laughs> open doors, and then they would move to the next door. Very, very, very simple paradigm. So crucially, we manipulated the degree of uncertainty about which specific animal children were searching for. So in the one animal condition, children were told that Sam was the lion. Whereas in the eight animals condition, children were told that Sam could be one of those eight animals. So in this way, finding, potentially finding the hidden animal be behind one of the closed doors would reveal not only the location of the animal, but its identity. So potentially more interesting. So although, as I said, the, the 
Sam, the hidden animal, was never really revealed, regardless of the time children spent uh, searching, our results indicate that children were more persistent in their search in the eight animals condition, which is in orange here, uh, when there was higher uncertainty as um, which animal they would be able to find, and therefore more information to be gained. So they open more doors on average, and they search for a longer time. This is an indication of first signs of leaving. So when they started kind of feeling uncomfortable with the task and started asking their mom, like, where is Sam? Or like started looking around. And the third measure we considered was completion. That is how many children actually ended up um, like continued opening door until the end of the task, um, which uh, was four minutes. Um, in this case. So we basically interrupted the game if kids looked away for longer than, um, I think, 30 seconds. Um, but if they kept on coming back to the screen, then we just uh, kept on playing for um, four minutes. Uh, it's interesting because we ended up limiting uh, uh, this to four minutes because the first children we played with, uh, some of them played for 35 minutes this game. <laughs> So this was COVID time. So the task was actually administered online. So kids just had to look at the screen and say like, um, open, open, instead of touching uh, on the tablet. And the first kids we piloted that was sitting next to the experimenter really took forever. And they were glued to the screen. They never got distracted. It was like, okay, we have to do something about this task. Otherwise this is gonna drive us crazy. Um, so we decided that after four minutes, we would just reveal uh, on the last door where Sam was hiding, hiding, so that we could kind of like have a happy ending to the entire search uh, sort of enterprise. Um, so we um, replicated these results in a second study where instead of contrasting a certain one animal condition, which one may argue is a little more salient, um, we um, used the two animals condition in which the uncertainty was still there, although it was there to a lesser extent compared to the eight animals condition. So we basically found the same results. So these are the same three measures I uh, presented before. Uh, and again, we have in orange uh, the eight animals condition and in green the sign the two animals condition. We also managed to replicate these results uh, in a third study in which this time we manipulated conditions within subjects. That was very surprising to us because we thought children somehow would remember what they'd done before. Obviously, we used two different sets of objects. So once we had the animals, once we had some kind of everyday objects, uh, uh, we had a little bit of a break in between uh, and still we managed to elicit the, the results that we were hoping for. So overall, these results indicate that in the absence of any rewards, uh, toddlers uh, or young preschoolers search is motivated by expected informativeness of the actions that be can be performed, highlighting the importance for artificial intelligence, for example, to invest on curiosity driven algorithms. So this study is published and we have basically spent the last uh, year and a half with Oana trying to replicate these results with um, older children and with adults. So I'm just gonna show you now um, the results we kind of managed to put together. So these results hold with preschoolers. That's like a big spoiler of what this slide is actually gonna be about. Um, so this time participants were three to five-year-olds. They were tasked to find the cookie thief. So we thought we will have to make it a little more compelling for children. So we had to um, give them a little bit of a cover story uh, that was a little more meaningful to them. So conditions this time were manipulated between subjects. In the low uncertainty condition, they were told that only two of the eight monsters liked chocolate chips cookies. Whereas in the high uncertainty condition, children were told that all the monsters liked cookies. They were given three minutes as a maximum limit for the search. And uh, the search action was the same, opening a potentially infinite amount of doors. And again, we found that preschooler search was motivated by the expected informativeness of the action available. So here we can see only one of the measures, but all the three measures we use were kind of um, converging. Uh, so they were um, opening more doors uh, in the high uncertainty condition uh, compared to the low uncertainty condition. 
then we're very motivated to see whether even older children will show this uh, result. And in this version, um, we had participants that were five to 11 year olds, but we also included adolescents and adults. And uh, the scenario, the task we gave them was a little more compelling even. So we had a mystery story um, and uh, children were basically tasked to find a murderer in a clue-like sort of game. We didn't make it like no, no splatter sort of images, no blood, uh, just like a clue sort of scenario. And in the low uncertainty condition, they were told that only two of the eight guests did not have an alibi for the night of the murder, so could uh, be considered potential suspects, whether, whereas in a high uncertainty condition, they were told that none of the guests had an alibi, so it could have been any of them. Um, again, the search action was the same, it was a hotel with a lot of doors, children were just opening doors, time limit was four minutes because we realized with pilot work that actually children were um, very much engaged in this a task. Um, and we found again that children's search, a list up to age 15, was uh, motivated by the expected informativeness of the action available. So here you can see that um, it's a different sort of plot, but um, they are uh, more persistent and they're more likely to open doors uh, in the high uncertainty condition compared to the low uncertainty condition. But interestingly, we, find that we found that effect completely disappeared um, after age 16. And we have tried an embarrassing amount of versions <laughs> to see whether we could replicate this effect with adults. Um, spoiler, we didn't manage. Um, the um, paradigm that looked a little more promising was this one was a museum uh, diamond heist. Um, again, very similar, low uncertainty, high uncertainty setup. This time, uh, we didn't have an infinite amount of doors because we thought maybe that's the action that uh, adults find just too tedious. So instead, we had um, video footage um, that we simulated, obviously. So very similar to the kind of example I gave at the beginning of this talk. Uh, but yeah, not really. So a little bit of a trend, a little bit of a tendency, but barely. Um, and we eventually uh, gave up. So we're now in the process of writing this paper. But if you have any ideas, because, you know, we kind of like try to think for so long about what could be the reasons why adults, only adults, or like children, like um, ad adolescents older than 16 would not um, kind of show this effect. If you have any ideas, happy to discuss this uh, later or to discuss this uh, during the uh, lunch break. Um, I want to mention two more things about this uh, project, and then we're going to see if there is still a little bit of time or not. So um, I'm just going to go over this very fast because you're probably not very much interested in infants, or at least not from the research sort of perspective. So we finished collecting data on a sample of um, one-year-olds. And the procedure was very similar uh, to the first study I presented. Conditions were again manipulated within subjects because, you know, like infants are hard to come by. So once we get them, we try to test them on everything. Um, and uh, we changed it a little bit, which I thought it was the interesting sort of um, 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 kind of upgrade um, of this uh, paradigm. We changed the way to convey the low uncertainty condition instead of showing that it, it could have been just one out of eight objects, we showed that the eight objects were all the same or the eight animals were all the same. So that was like a little easier to convey to infants uh, compared to the verbal sort of Sam can only be a lion um, formulation. And we found exactly the same results. So this time uh, we used looking time and um, we found that across the entire age range we tested, um, um, infants were more likely to look um, at the doors and to they also open more doors in the high uh, uncertainty condition compared to the low uncertainty condition. And we also found an effect in pupil dilation as an additional measure of their sort of um, um, excitement or interest um, in the event that could have happened. Um, now, this studies overall, I think, um, Kind of put together a pretty robust picture of um, indicating that information gain 
can be a robust driver of search persistence, at least across childhood. However, it's very unclear how this influence compares with uh, uh, extrinsic rewards. Um, and to address this question, we modified the mystery story paradigm I presented earlier. We let five to 15 year olds choose whether they wanted to play one of two different games um, between which we manipulated both the uncertainty. Now this is in Italian because we tested in Italy, uh, high uncertainty or low uncertainty, you should be able to recognize this pattern by now. So um, one of many sus suspects versus like uh, one of few suspects, but we also manipulated the rewards. That is how many stickers they could win by playing that game or the other game. So basically this resulted in this kind of matrix of experimental manipulation and they were manipulated within subjects. So th this kind of makes sense. So sometimes um, high uncertainty corresponded to high rewards, sometimes the opposite was true. And it was manipulated, as I said, within subjects. So they actually had to go through both tasks. Um, we are still collecting data, but we already got almost 100 participants. Um, we found so far that there was a strong effect of reward on the choice of which game they wanted to play. So basically just to, I don't know if you can read it from far away, but the, the two bars on top are uh, the proportion of participants who chose the um, one task having the higher uncertainty versus the one, the gray bar on the right is the proportion of participants who chose the game with higher reward. You can see that there is no effect of, um, of um, uncertainty on uh, game choice, but there is a pretty strong effect of reward on game choice. That kind of makes sense. Those who chose the game they could win the most stickers for. Um, and this is just uh, basically um, a replotting of kind of the same thing. But what is interesting is that once they enter the game, what is really modulating their persistency, so how long they're actually willing to search, is not the reward anymore, but is the uncertainty, as we have shown in um, the other studies I presented today. Um, so if you look at the information search of the chosen task, this is the number of doors uh, they actually go through, and we see the effect that is kind of very similar and comparable to the magnitude of the effects we have found in the previous studies. But if we plot it by reward of the chosen task, we find zero difference. So um, overall, um, well, one last thing is that we don't really have um, yet a complete data sample, but it looks like younger children may be a little more likely than older children or um, adolescents to actually select their game at the very beginning based on uncertainty compared to rewards. So what we've shown now is like across all age groups, but if we actually uh, plot this uh, by kind of age group, younger children, older children, we see that uh, older children are more likely to choose based on reward, younger children are slightly more likely to select the game, even the game based on uncertainty. So overall, I think the set of data is hopefully gonna hold. <laughs> 50 more uh, participants, um, but um, the data indicate a strong dissociation between uh, rewards as a decision factor and uncertainty as a modulator of persistence, suggesting a pretty complex interplay between extrinsic and intrinsic motivator of exploratory behaviors across development. And many questions are still open, but um, I think I will stop here with this project. Now I wonder, because we're running a little late. Is there still time to present one more thing? Uh, you have uh, three minutes. Three minutes, wow. Okay, so I just wanted to, I'm gonna skip a bunch of things. No, I'm not gonna skip a bunch of things. So as I said, this is, was an example of um, my line of work um, on focusing on the mechanisms of developmental change. But I just wanted to give you an example of uh, the kind of work that we hope to do that goes more in the classroom sort of intervention uh, direction. Um, I think um, we're also trying to kind of merge the line of work I presented this morning with um, a more kind of applied um, educational uh, sort of perspective. And, um, and, the, and what I'm going to present now is just an example of how this kind of more 
uh, basic cognitive work can actually go and stretch out a little more in an applied sort of perspective. So in particular, I wanted to briefly mention this one series of studies that are all in collaboration with Dark Markant. Um, so here, basically, uh, the, the main paradigm is that we ask children, adults, uh, toddlers, so we have done this with all age groups, um, we ask them to um, remember 64 objects. Um, and basically, um, objects are displayed in grids of four by four, so 16 objects at a time, there are four blocks. And for half of these materials, children or participants more generally can decide the order and pacing of studies. So we call this the active condition. Whereas for the other half, children or participants more generally can just see the active behavior of the previous participant. So we call this a yoke design. Um, this is um, particularly interesting from a cognitive science perspective because obviously the uh, in the end, the data participants are exposed to is identical across conditions. These are manipulated within subjects, although the modality is very drastically different, right? So at test, children were basically asked to um, uh, click on the objects they had studied before. Um, and uh, the 64 uh, objects they had studied before were mixed up with 64 objects they had not seen before. Um, and um, this is kind of the main results we got. Uh, in red, you see the average um, sort of recognition rate for the active condition, whereas in blue, you see the yoke condition. So systematically at all ages, although the effect is not really significant at age five, we see that participants are more likely to recognize correctly the objects that they have learned through active study compared to the objects they have learned through yoked study. Um, and what is interesting is that uh, these effect um, holds even one to two weeks after the first testing study session. Um, we have um, uh, replicated these results. I'm not going to go through that um, across many different versions across different countries. Um, we used uh, different sort of materials to be learned, including language learning. So we tried actually having children learning French words with a similar sort of paradigms and the same sort of pattern holds. Um, we tried this with children affected by autism. That also somehow shows a promising results. And we recently replicated this result with infants. Uh, so we're talking about children, I mean, infants basically from uh, 10 months uh, to 35 months. This plot is only from 17 and a half months, but the very new data set that we're still kind of uh, plotting shows that this holds even with uh, younger children. So again, this is just to give you a feeling of the way we hope at some point, some of the results uh, uh, that we're collecting that are very sort of abstract, especially for people interested in classroom work and education could potentially be applied to more um, educational intervention. Uh, and with this, I thank you. This is my uh, lab. Um, yeah, thank you for the attention. So we already have two questions in the, uh, from people remotely connected. So the first one by uh, Christian Julius Lack. Um, is, he asked, could, could it also mean, for the, 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 the previous study you presented, the last one, could it also mean that young learners would be more curious when said that the math problem has eight different solutions than two? Yeah. It, that that's so that's one of the ways in which we're actually trying to uh to to get into more applied work so it's kind of close to some of the things that we've been discussing this morning about hypothesis generation thinking about alternative solutions so one idea could be that if we actually prompt children to think about many different ways to solve a problem they could actually be more likely to persist in solving that problem however like i think one um one point I've been struggling with uh, with some of my uh, collaborators, which I also think we may disagree with, is that um, having children persisting in a task is not necessarily a good thing. And I think the moment you get um, to kind of use more applied sort of like um, 
setups. Uh, for example, instead of using, you know, like animals and objects, thinking about solutions. Uh, I think it would be important to think about the contextual factors in which being persistent would make more sense rather than not. Um, so, yeah, but this is exactly the direction we're trying to go um, to. Can you just give an example of a, a situation where you think being persistent for a child would not be the best response? Um, this is my favorite conversation with my colleague, Julia Leonard. I don't know if you know her work. Um, she's working with uh, toddlers and um, preschoolers on persistent pers persistence. And um, she's American. So um, we talk a lot about um, how American parents kind of trying to prompt their children to always persist. You can be whatever you want. You just have to endure. If you set your mind, you know, this mind growth, you know, like a mind growth mindset, growth mindset uh, that somehow is um, getting increasingly popular in the U.S., which is absolutely not popular in Germany or Italy, um, which I think have a more realistic sort of mindset. Oh, you're really good at this. You should really, you know, invest your time in this. Oh, you're actually really crap at this. I don't think you should be, you know, like persisting at this, which I find it very interesting because I think, you know, you can do this with love. You can tell your child you're not really talented at drawing, but hey, there's so many other things you're great at. So this is like one way in which I think we could play um, the cross-cultural difference, but also potentially... Um, a look at how different, um, um, you know, like parenting styles may affect a children's persistence and the ecological sort of uh, adaptiveness of children's persistence. So this is a project that um, we're actually studying, working on with Julia at the moment. Um, so I guess one concrete example is really like if a child persists doing something they're somehow not talented for, uh, and maybe they're not, uh, they're not really getting... <laughs> I don't know, good feelings about it because. Uh, but your research was the persistence acquiring new information. Yes. So um, actually, we're controlling for the information acquired because they're not acquiring any information. It's more the perspective of potentially acquiring some information. Which is a little different than persisting in the attempt to perform something. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, but now we were talking about how, you know, we could move from this more cognitive work to something that is a little more applied. I think um, that sort of shift would require thinking about more contextual factors that may affect persistence, including, you know, like whether it's just about getting information or about performing future job sort of, you know, like uh, um, prospects or, or, you know, parenting styles and things like that. Uh, there is another question from uh, Katarina Vegus about the, <laughs> the last uh, experiment you presented. And uh, she's asking, uh, she, was, she, she was not uh, completely sure uh, which uh, developmental change mechanism you were proposing to explain the, the data you were showing. The uncertainty, I wish I could see Katarina, but I can't. Uh, are we talking about the uncertainty versus rewards uh, motivation? Yes, I think it was yeah. classic when you were presenting that. Yeah, so um, we haven't really thought about this, mostly because we still, um, we still haven't really checked whether the developmental sort of difference holds. Um, so we just didn't want to, you know... Uh, dream about what we hope we're going to find. But the idea is that children, uh, maybe if we really find that younger children are more likely to select their task based on uncertainty rather than on reward, we could somehow link to the literature on young children being somehow curious, uh, how intrinsic reward somehow is more motivated for younger children rather than for older children who may be more motivated by, um, by, um, by rewards. Um, obviously, we do find this in terms of uh, persistence, but um, for both age groups. But it may be that even the choice of what kind of task uh, one would engage with uh, for older children and adults is mediated by task rewards. Whereas for younger children, if it's just if it's only about which task one should engage with, younger children are more likely to do something there curious about uh, and they may be learning something more 
uh, with or through compared to older children who may be just all around motivated by um, reward. Jamie, how's that question? Um, I had a question when you were talking about that. I was surprised that the reward was stickers because we find even younger children these days don't care at all about stickers. And so especially like a 15 year old, like why do I want three stickers versus one sticker? And I was wondering if maybe the stickers were indicating external value of the tasks. And so maybe it's a shift, not necessarily to like that type of extrinsic reward, it's sort of like a concrete reward, but more a shift in like the younger kids don't tend to be very aware of or care that much about how others perceive them. And it's re they're really kind of intrinsically driven to like, they're, they're thinking about their own perspective, their own thoughts. Whereas as you get older, social comparison becomes much more of a motivator. And so maybe the value is what was changing in turn in creating that extrinsic reward kind of idea. I was just curious, like, did anyone say like, oh, I don't want stickers? Like, even when we, we have kids perform things to get stickers and they're like, that's okay, I don't want them. Our, sti <laughs> our stickers are really cool. <laughs> I have to say that. <laughs> so no, it has not happened to us. Um, so in, in terms of like a more concrete sort of low level answer is that, um, uh, even the, even the adults are very interested in getting the stickers. They're kind of monster stickers. They're all looking the same, the different, um, here we only basically give points. So like how many stickers and we just have a neutral representation for them, but then they know, and they're told that they can choose that number of stickers among like the kind of, um, bunch of stickers we have available for them. We have them look at the stickers. They're very popular. Um, but the uh, more kind of high level interesting um, answer to this is that this may be one of the uh, kind of mechanisms uh, at work, especially if we find that um, for younger children at least, a reward is not even motivating uh, the, 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 the kind of choice of the task. So, so far, um, again, I, I don't have a plot for this. Uh, but it looks like very young children, so like only five and six year olds, um, are are still motivated by reward, which makes us think that they are sensitive to the reward manipulation. They are just less sensitive to this in the decision making compared to older adults. So that makes us think that oh, think that overall they are still sensitive to the reward manipulation. They are just less sensitive to this compared to older participants. Obviously, if we found that younger children were not sensitive at all in none of the two measures to rewards, then we will have to think about something like that. Uh, but it could be that one, yeah, we're going to think about this as a potential kind of explanation if the results hold. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you.